So we've deduced that a number of factors led to journalists deciding that this scene needed a new name on account of the fact that the bands played louder than ever, that they often dabbled in satanic imagery, and that they went on the rampage on the road with stories of insane alcohol and drug intake and wild pranks. But we haven't talked about the girls. Groupies were a key factor in rock becoming heavy metal, and it became an art form in the 70s. One lady made a real name for herself, but not just by sleeping with all the biggest rock stars. She was also kind enough to plaster cast their wangs, and by wangs, I mean their hot dang a lang dicks. I, I started having quivers in my crotch, not understanding right. anything about that, because my mother had always told me that sex was bad and only good for reproduction. Not true. <laughs> and I'd never seen a penis before, so I thought, well, I guess that's what I must um, aspire to do was have actual sex. My first attempt at trying to meet a band was the Rolling Stones. I was still a virgin, 17. I figured out how to find their hotel very easy, just ask for Bill Wyman's name, because everyone probably by then was asking for Brian Jones or Mick Jaggers. And sure enough, he was staying at the Water Tower Hyatt. So I just went there, not knowing what I would do. In this beautiful blur of long hair, I just walked up to the first one that walked in and said, are you a stone? And it was Andrew Luke Oldham. Right, 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 the producer. Yeah. He, he reeked of scotch, and he just started making out with me, which no one had ever done before. Just like that? Just like that. Tongue in the ear. I couldn't believe it. I went into a total shock. I could feel like the cyclones whirling around yeah. me, and then he walked away. You know, I was still a good Catholic girl. I stayed in the lobby, and my friend followed them up to their room and was chatting very nicely with Mick and Keith. And then Andrew came along, and he had a gun, and he, he started chasing her around the room. Mick and Keith could not apprehend him, get the gun away from him, and they kept calling for Charlie, who got tired of all, hearing all the commotion, and give Andrew one punch in the nose, knock him out cold, and went back to his soap opera. No way, just Seamlessly. like that. So, obviously, you, you are most famous for your plaster casters. When did you come up with this beautiful idea? It was um, one homework assignment I got from my art teacher. In art class, we started doing plaster casting. One day, the teacher said you could plaster cast almost anything that's solid. And, in fact, bring in any old object from home. Make a plaster cast of something solid that could retain its shape. I had just learned that penises could keep their shape and got very solid, sometimes. Jimi Hendrix was my biggest, perhaps, one of my most exciting moldings. How big was his dick? I swear. Oh my God. Baby, look at that. Boom, that ain't no joke. These are all semi-hearts, except for Dennis. He was coming, came in the mold. I gotta let my baby yeah. on camera to come grip the Jimmy. <laughs> ah. <laughs> I'm sorry, I got so overwhelmed. It was like tick, 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 tick. <laughs> We're gonna bring it all back. I wanna know something about Led Zeppelin. Diane Plastercaster and I decided to drive to Detroit, see them catch them before they came to the, the bigger city. Um, it was Robert Plant's room. Out of nowhere, like on cue, they turned off the TV, and they, and they started ripping my clothes off and, and chasing me around the room, spraying me with all di different kind of fluids. And um, I remember they chased me into the, the shower. You didn't get hurt, did you? No, no, not physically. I know I wouldn't be, and I know you wouldn't be excited by this sort of like crazy element, of, but do you think a lot of girls are? I noticed they were. One of them talks about how much fun it was getting beaten up. I guess they had good drugs together. Yeah. Have you retired from being a groupie? I haven't had any groupie action in a while. We're going to change that, girl. But I, but I have Tuesday night, I'm going to make this happen. <laughs> <laughs> we'll see. <laughs> <laughs> so as I bid a fond farewell to the plaster caster, with a promise that she'll mold my big old JT next time we meet, mm. We gotta get back on the on the road tour bus, and eventually our driver, the Badger, gets me to where I'm meeting the Uber roadie. Known to some as Bob Mitchell, who has worked with all five of the holy quintet of British metal Black Sabbath, Led Zeppelin, Judas Priest, Iron Maiden, and Motorhead. There's nobody who's ever seen more truly about the shit that's going on than the road crew. Yeah. You are one of the uh, notorious members of the gang, if you will, man. You got a few nicknames. Yeah, one of them Pitbull for obvious reasons. <laughs> I'll always try and get everything done. You know right. what I mean? I will push it to the limits to get it done. I'll growl and bite, fight and kick to make sure that show goes ahead. The first time I actually met Lemmy was the heavy metal barn dogs. He said, you had anything to eat yet, breakfast? 
I went, no, and he went, come here, and he just grabbed me hair like that, and he opened his bottle of blue smirt off. You had your breakfast now, you know. That was my introduction as a 16 and a half year old. Lemmy scared the fuck out of me the first time I saw <laughs> Lemmy, like, oh shit, it, yeah. that to me is heavy metal. Well, no one's ever called him by his real name, I think, since his family, you know what I mean? Lemmy, Lemmy a fiver, Lemmy a tenner. Yes. That's the name, you know. Lemmy a fiver. <laughs> <laughs> You know, a lot of roadies are forgotten about, treated like a second-class citizen by some bands, no. but not in metal. Well, so. see, you got to remember, is Lemmy started as a roadie for Jimi yeah. Hendrix. Yeah, right, right, you know right. I mean, he had to test all the drugs. So, you know, hey, what a mm -hmm. job. With Motorhead especially, they've always been like that. I mean, we'd fight together, we'd get drunk together, we'd rock together. And that was it. We was a very close-knit family. Brian Robson, who was Robbo out of Finn Lizzy, would join Motorhead. Right, right, right. Basically, he was out in the bar in Germany with a couple of the other crew. And he had a pair of ballet shoes, pink ballet shoes on, and a pair of green silk shorts on, and a little vest on, and bright red hair. He dyed his hair, and he's sitting in his bar full of skinheads. Don't give a shit rat's ass about anybody. That's Robbo, right? You know what I mean? And he's sitting there, and obviously the other two of the crews there conceded it was going to be trouble, so let's go back. Lemmy, let's go sort it. All for one, one for all. That's beautiful. As tempting as it was to listen to more great stories from the heyday of metal, I wanted to take things up to date and meet up with some of the kids I met at karaoke last night. They have a little scene of brewing that bows down to the originators of heavy metal, and tonight they were going to see a new band called Amulet play a house party in North London. And I'm not talking about some new metal or emo band or some on-the-cuff pussy metal band. These guys refused to listen to any music after 1984. These are the real deal, the truth. Amen. to investigate Black Sabbath as a source of heavy metal. And I'm here tonight and I'm seeing you guys staying fucking true to something. I mean, honestly, you guys fucking shred it. How did you get into it? Well, I was 13 years old. I listened to them. It's like, fuck, this is the most energetic music I've ever heard in my life. And it changed my life, man. Is there a viable living scene? Because I see some purists. When we discovered the new wave of British heavy metal, that was like, like we all love 70s rock. And the next progression is the new wave of British heavy metal. And for us, that's like the one thing we love so much. When I was laying in the fetal position, uh, ready to become like some sort of sex executioner, this was really surprising to me. You guys got me charged up again, and I want to thank you for that. Oh my God, so inspired was I by seeing a new generation of little old music fans and boys respecting the real shit that I decided to play an impromptu gig of Sabbath covers to my six friends at full volume in the back of the van as it sped across London at top speeds. People, I want everyone out there to listen to me. It's time to get saved, amen. Here we go, people, walking the streets of London. Is there anyone here prepared tonight to give themselves up to the spirit of the night? Amen. What have I learned? Hmm. Well, hard dick bromances with magical wizards in the middle of a forest can produce quite a few things other than magical wands. <laughs> if a girl asks you to cast your dick in plaster, you probably ain't been doing nothing too wrong. It's totally acceptable to cultivate a mullet once you get over 40. And if a band you've just met asks you to get half naked and cover your face, just run with it. Just do it. Amen. So most importantly, I had it confirmed that Black Sabbath were an immaculate conception. That they were something magical that made itself happen out of sheer need and will. Something truly divine. Four lads from Brum who by accident created an entirely new sound that would last for over 40 years and we know it will last forever. 
If I could contribute 5% of what Bill Ward and his buddies contributed to Music Heritage, have even 5% as much fun as they did, and still turn out to be lovely, humble dudes, the sort of wonderful wizards you want to worship as they have turned out to be, then I will die a happy and satisfied man. Have fun, kids, and never forget the ones who started it all, Black Sabbath.